Please join with me in the call to worship. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt God's name together. When I sought you, O God, you answered me, and delivered me from all of my fears. Look upon God's counsel, countenance and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in you, O oh God. Let us worship God.
first scripture reading is from the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 3. You can find it on page 226 in the New Testament on your, in your pew Bible. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Mary. Continuing the reading of God's holy word this day, I would ask you to look, wait a minute, I have last week's, there we go. I would ask you to look at the Gospel of Matthew, the 14th chapter, beginning with verse 22. That's Matthew 14, verses 22 through 34. Here now as we read and as we share together God's Word. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat, go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. When evening had come, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, ravaged by the waves, for the wind was against them. And now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were afraid. And they said, it's a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, be of good cheer. Do not be afraid. It is I. But immediately, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So Jesus said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was all about him, he was afraid. And he began to sink, and he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand, and he caught him. And he said to him, O ye of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those who were in the boat came and worshipped him and said, Truly, you are the Son of God. Here ends this reading of God's holy word. To his name be glory and praise both now and forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. I want Jesus to walk with me. I want Jesus to walk with me. Amen. 
There was a young mother who decided that she wanted her daughter to have swimming lessons. Growing up as a little girl herself, she had always been afraid of the water. She had never learned to swim. And so she was determined to make sure that her little one would not be afraid if she walked along a lake, if she took a trip to the beach. She took her daughter to the local YMCA. They were offering classes. And so she signed her up and she went a couple of times a week. And the first night of class, she met the instructor, the lifeguard, and they eased her into the water. in the shallow end, just to get acclimated. They also would fit her up with some water weights, personal flotation devices, so that she would feel safe. As the weeks went by, the lessons increased, and so did the challenges. There was one week where, although she was still wearing the water wing, she would now move into the deeper sections and her, no longer could she touch the bottom of the pool. And so she was learning to tread water with the assistance of the flotation devices. Another week, another round of lessons. This time, she would be in the shallow end again. All of a sudden, the devices were removed and she was learning various strokes on how to swim. Finally, after a couple of months, it was decided that she would have her first test. Now, there's a variety of tests that you can take when you take a class. Perhaps you can have an oral examination and they ask you questions. Perhaps you can have a written exam. But if you're learning to swim, neither one of those options is really going to test how well you're doing. There is only one way to find out whether or not she is being successful. She's going to have to get in the water. And not only get into the water, she's going to have to get into the deep end without the assistance of the water wings. The training wheels are now off. And she stands at the edge of the pool, the deep end. And at that moment, she has a decision to make. She can either sink or swim. It's a lot like life, isn't it? As we stand at the threshold of whatever it is we're going to do in life, oftentimes those are our options, are they not? Perhaps you're beginning a new school year. You can either sink or swim. Perhaps you're starting a new challenge. You got to get in the water sink or swim. Perhaps you're starting a new job. Sink or swim. A new career. A new life. A new home. Whatever it is, we stand at the edge of the pool and we have but two options. Well, I guess we have a third option and that's to not do anything. We can just stand there and watch the world go by. Jesus called his disciples. He called the first 12. And of the first 12, do you remember who the first four were? You're allowed to participate. Peter, Andrew, James, John. Those four, what do we know about them? They're fishermen, very good. Now remember, Jesus is planning on starting a kingdom. He would say to Peter, you are the rock and upon which I will build a church, a community, a community that will transcend time and space. He is building a kingdom, a kingdom that we are still a part of thousands of years later, thousands of miles away from where it began. What do you
you think of the people he picked? Are those the four people you would have selected to begin such an enterprise? Four fishermen? Don't you think that they should have had some other skills? The ability to teach, to preach, to proclaim, the ability to inspire. They were fishermen. And as fishermen, what did they know how to do? What were they really good at? Catching fish. Jesus would say, I will teach you to not catch fish, but to catch people. But it wasn't a matter of just catching the fish. There were all the things that went with it. Because let me ask you this, did these fishermen stand on the shore with a line and cast it into the cast of bait in the hook into the sea? How did they fish? On a boat. And so they not only had to be good fishermen, they had to be good sailors. And being a sailor at this time was a whole lot different than it is now. Because these boats were not exactly the most stable things you've ever seen. And so if you went out on a boat and you went out on the sea, what else did you have to know how to do? I don't know about you folks, but I would think that a prerequisite of being a sailor in those times was being able to swim. Because it, there were a lot of storms. There was a lot of wind. The waves, it tells us in the scriptures, would ravish around them. And what do you think happened to that little boat when the waves kicked up and the wind came along? Do you think it ever capsized? Do you think maybe they were knocked overboard? And when they went overboard, do you think that they had the water wings that we give our children now? Do you think that they had personal flotation devices like we have now? Do you think that they had a certain number of lifeboats that were mandatory on the middle of that shipping boat? No, they just went in the water. And what did they have to do when they landed in the water? Swim. Survive. These folks were excellent at understanding how to swim. Because if you couldn't swim, what were you going to do? Sink. So now we're told that Jesus tells them instructs them to go out in a boat. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. They were in the boat. Where was Jesus? What's that? He stayed on the shore. Why did he stay on the shore? When he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. He was alone there. So now, let's paint this picture, because sometimes we kind of forget the setting of all of this. What we have is, is we have Jesus, who is up here on this mountain. We have his disciples who are down here on a boat. And where they are on the boat, they're not sitting in dock, they are out on the sea. So now what you have is, these folks are out here, he is up here, the stage is set. The boat was in the middle of the sea tossed by the waves for they were ravishing them and the wind was I love this word against them has anybody here ever had the wind against you just kind of blowing backwards I mean it's going to knock you over I want you to think about these folks they are on the boat they are seasoned sailors it is pitching back and forth they're frightened they know how bad it is. And now the wind literally is against them. It is fighting them. They are in the midst of this challenge. And where is Jesus? On the mountain. He's not in the middle of any of this stuff. Whose idea was it to get in the boat? Jesus. He made them, it tells you, get into the boat. And he's nowhere to be found. The fourth watch, the middle of the night, Jesus came to them. And what was he doing? It says here he was walking on the sea. I want you to picture this. They are in the midst of this big challenge, this huge storm. And they look out in the middle of it and there they see who? 
Jesus. And what's he doing? Is he standing there like a lighthouse? It says he is walking, and he is walking towards them. Now the disciples saw him walking on the sea. Picture this, if you will. Do you think in the midst of the storm they were praying? Let me ask you a better question. In the midst of a storm, do you pray? In the storms of life, do you pray to God? Come, Lord Jesus? Absolutely. So they are praying for God's deliverance. They are praying for help. They are praying for God to do something. And they look up from their prayers. They raise their eyes and they see who? Jesus. If you were praying now for help, for guidance, for strength, for safety, and you looked up and you saw Jesus coming towards you, how would you feel? Safe. Pretty good. I prayed for the Lord to come and the Lord is coming. Jesus went to them walking on the sea. The disciples saw him walking on the sea and they were afraid. Why were they afraid? Why? They were asking for the Lord to come and he was coming to them. But they said, it's a ghost. They cried out in fear. When I was a little boy, my mom and dad for Christmas bought me a bicycle. Some of you folks may have got a bicycle for Christmas. That was a popular thing at one time, right? Had a leopard skin seat. Well, it wasn't skin, it was printed, right? And it had these really cool streamers on the handlebars. Not only that, it had a bell and a horn. It also had, since it was my first bike, it had training wheels. So I got it for Christmas. Remember, we lived here in, in, in western Pennsylvania. So you get something for Christmas. That's like the bad thing about giving somebody a bicycle for Christmas because it's cold outside, right? But that didn't stop us. We wheel it outside. I'm riding around on the bike. I'm beeping the horn. I'm ringing the bell. I'm enjoying this. This is great. Of course, it's tipping back and forth because it's caught on the training wheels, right? This worked until springtime. We would take it out, ride it around the driveway, put it away. Springtime came, however, and it was time to take the training wheels off. It was time to learn to swim without the water wings. Well, we took the training wheels off, and I took a look at it. And I know we have some of you folks that are engineers and physicists and everything. I'm not. But I figured one thing out when I looked at that bicycle. It had these little narrow tires in the front and these little narrow tires in the back. And I was a whole lot wider than those little narrow tires. And for the life of me, I couldn't figure out how that thing would stand up with me sitting on it. In fact, I tried it out. You couldn't even stand the bicycle up without putting the kickstand on. And if I sat on it, it either leaned one side or the other because you had to get one foot down just to hold it up. There was no way that thing could work, at least in my mind. It needed two more wheels on this side to be stable. I wanted my training wheels back. Lo and behold, my mom and dad, they tried everything, and the minute I tried to get on it, I'd fall off it, and I'd fall off it again, and they did the best they could. But in all fairness, they didn't want me to fall anymore and cry and scream and all that stuff. So it just sat there for a while until there was this little girl down the street, and she had a big sister. And they were determined I was going to learn how to ride that bike. So, one day in the early summer, we took the bike out, the three of us, and we got to the top of this big hill. Oh, no. You know, I think back nowadays, you can't do this stuff nowadays, right? You get up on a big hill with a bicycle, man, you got to have a helmet on and a rubber suit and all this kind of stuff. Back then, you know, they just put you on a bike and away you go, right? And, you know, I'm still here, so it must have worked. Sure enough, I get on the bike. A little girl on one side of me, her big sister on the other side, she's holding the back end of the tube. So they got it braced up like this. We get to the edge of the hill. They got it standing up. And they decided to take off running. So they started running straight ahead down the hill. Well, they couldn't run very long because the darn thing got moving fast, right? And so then they let go of it. Because that's how we did stuff. 
And here's the amazing thing. That thing stood up. And for a moment, I was riding a bike. Now, I probably should have rang the bell or beeped the horn, but I was so excited it worked. And I'm zooming down the hill with the little streamers are flying up like this. And I'm thinking, this is great. This is wonderful. I'm riding a bike. It works. And then you know what I did? I looked down. I looked down and I looked at that tower and I looked at everything there. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it works. And I got scared. Because there's no way it can work. There's no way this thing should stand up. And so I looked down and I looked around and all of a sudden I lost everything and bang, boom, it crashed. Now that never happened to any of you folks, right? Peter. He hears Jesus call. And Peter does a heroic act. My father years ago told me what a hero is. We've been studying heroes, correct? So we had Samson, who was a hero. We had Gideon, who was a hero. We had David, who was a hero. And I'm about to tell you that Peter was a hero. Because heroes, my dad taught me one time, are people who act before they think. Because if you think about it, if you think about the consequences of your actions, you will probably not do it. But you act in the moment. You act out of passion. You, you act out of faith. You fa act out of whatever it is that motivates you. Think about this. If David would have thought of the consequences of his action, he's standing there looking at this giant with nothing more than some rocks in his hand and a slingshot. This doesn't make sense. If he thought before he acted, he'd have never stepped on the battlefield. If Gideon would have thought about how foolish it was to fight with the entire army of Midian with 300 people, he'd have left. But he acted before he thought. And if Peter would have thought about his actions before he stepped out of that boat, he'd have never stepped out. You see, the heroic acts that you see with Gideon were not an act of might and strategy. It was an act of faith. The heroic act of David was not a, an act of courage and prowess. It was an act of faith. And the heroic act of Peter was an act of faith. Jesus said what? Come. And Peter immediately jumped out of the boat and did what? He walked on the water. Did he sink? Did he swim? No. He had the faith to move forward. He didn't think. He went. However, he began to walk across the water. In fact, it says... It says to us here, Peter had come out of the boat. He walked on the water to go to Jesus. Walked, meaning he was actually taking steps. He was moving forward. And then he saw the wind and he was afraid. He realized the bicycle was up. He realized it started to work. As long as he was acting on faith, he could do anything. If you have so much faith, you can do what? You can move a mountain. I can do all things. How? Through him who gives me strength. As long as he stayed focused on Jesus, he was upright. He was walking on the water. He was accomplishing the impossible. But the moment that he set it aside, the moment that he let the fears of the world enter into this, he did what? He sank. It says here, immediately, he began to sink. The other day, this past week, I had the opportunity. We took a ride out to see Moses out in Lancaster. I had to pronounce it right. So we went out there and we visited a few other places. And on the way back, 
One of the things that we did the day we left, we rode the Strasburg Railroads. Anybody ever ridden on the Strasburg Railroad? There you go. And the Strasburg Railroad, it's really speedy and fast, right? No. The guy on there said that he, we, he, he said to us, he said, we are going to go less than 100 miles an hour. A lot less. <laughs> so we're riding on this train. It can't be going more than 10 miles an hour. You could walk faster. But we're riding on the train, and as we're riding on the train, it struck me that people rode across the country like this. This is how people traveled. This is the speed of which they traveled. On the way home, we got back in the car, we hit the turnpike. We're going down the road 70, 75 miles an hour. We're just out for a drive. We think nothing of going down the road at 70 miles an hour. That's the speed limit. Most of you will probably exceed that. I, of course, never would. <laughs> we prayed a prayer of confession earlier. I learned a long time ago, if you want to drive fast, what do you got to do? Keep your eyes on the road. In fact, the faster you go, I'm looking back there, I see Bill and I see Rick. Those are Corvette guys, right? The faster you go, the further you look down the road. You got to have a feel of this. You cannot take your eyes off the road. What happens if you take your eyes off the road? You're going to crash. Have you ever seen somebody going down the road texting? Have you ever seen somebody going down the road putting their makeup on? Have you ever seen somebody driving down the road reading a book? Dangerous, isn't it? Take your eyes off the road, you're going to crash. Take your eyes off of Jesus, you're going to sink. All Peter had to do is hear Jesus calling him. And all he had to do is keep his eyes and his focus on him. The minute he got distracted, the minute that he began to listen to the things of this world, the minute he looked down, he realized that the bicycle was moving. And he said, we pray to the Lord. In the midst of our challenges, in the midst of our troubles, we pray to the Lord to come. And then when the Lord comes, do we receive him? Do we recognize him or are we afraid? And if we have the courage to step out of the boat, if we have the courage to jump off of the side of the pool, if we have the courage to enter the water, do we have the focus to keep watching him? I've served a number of churches in my ministry, and as a result of being a part of that, I get to go visit a bunch more. This week alone, I've got to go see two other churches within our presbytery. It's part of being a presbyter. And a lot of times those churches ask the same thing. They're struggling. They're in trouble. The storms of life are ravaging all around them. The wind seems to be against them and nothing works. And so they asked for the magic bullet. They asked for the magic answer. What can we do? And the one thing I can tell them is keep your eyes on what? Jesus. Because yes, even our churches, they don't keep their eyes on Jesus. They worry about the details. They worry about all this stuff. They worry and they listen to the things of this world. They trust in the training wheels and they trust in the water wings and they trust this. And that's churches. That's not just the people that are in them. If you want to save, to survive the storm, if you want to deal with the wind that's against you, the answer is simple. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Do not look away. For he is there and he is calling us as individual people, as churches, as the people of God. We're praying and he's there. I love this story, however, because it goes on to say this. It tells us that when he was afraid and when he was retracted, he began to sing. When he was distracted, he began to sing, and he cried out, and he said, Lord, do what? Save me. 
I told you we went out to see the, the, the show Moses at production. The very first time I went out there, I actually went with a group from this church, and we went out there to see Jesus. I'm looking, I think I remember with, with, with you two guys were there with us, right? And there were a lot of other folks here, but I remember going to see that. And that very first production that I saw, what I saw was this very scene that we're talking about, this text. And at that moment, we saw Peter have the courage to step from the boat. And we also witnessed him take his eyes off Jesus and falter. And he began to sing. In one of the most powerful moments of that production, what we saw was the hand of Jesus reach down. Take Peter by the hand and pull him back up. Peter took his eyes off Jesus. He began to sink and he cried out, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him. Friends, I have little doubt that each and every one of you has dealt with the winds and the storms of life. I have little doubt that you have prayed and asked the Lord to come. I have little doubt that at that point in time that you have actually kept your eyes on Jesus and he has led you through some of those storms. And I also have little doubt that you have taken your eyes off him and that you, like me, have failed. And that we have begun to sink. The message is here. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your eyes on the prize. Look to Jesus, as Mary said in Hebrews, as the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Looking to Jesus. But when you look away, when you falter, when you fail, when you are afraid, when you begin to sing, the message is clear that immediately Jesus will stretch out his hand and catch you. And he may admonish you and say, oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? But then they got in the boat and the wind ceased. My friends, keep your eyes on Jesus. Do not turn away. Do not be distracted by the things of this world. Do not trust in your own ability. Keep your eyes firmly fixed on him. Even if you falter, even if you fail, even if you doubt a little bit, he will catch you. He will pull you up. The winds will cease. And you can do amazing things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things, what you have learned and heard and received it do. And the God of peace will be with you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.